Hello again. Uh, today's lecture is on Simone de Beauvoir, a French author, and her book uh, entitled The Second Sex, or A Not-So-Rebellious Other. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir is the first female author that you are going to read since the beginning of intercultural studies. In fact, in all the first courses that you took, we didn't have one single female author. In this uh, course, we are going to have two. One of them is Simone de Beauvoir, whom we are going to read this week. And the other one is a Lebanese author uh, called Hanan al-Sheikh, who will talk about a girl called Apple, which will be the week after. Now, uh, the, uh, the reason why we didn't have female authors uh, are many. Some people think that we didn't have female authors because the female authors had nothing to say. Others think we don't have female authors because they didn't have a chance to publish or they weren't educated enough to put their ideas in writing. And yet we have a number of French authors and other authors who wrote under a male name because they thought this would be more popular and more accepted, like female author called Georges Sand. Uh, she was signing as Georges Sand, but she was actually a female. Now, Simone de Beauvoir was uh, born in France, and uh, she uh, was a very good friend of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. In fact, they lived all their lives almost together, but uh, they never got married because they were against the, the idea of marriage and commitment. And they are buried next to each other in, 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 the, in the cemetery of Montparnasse in Paris. She died in 1986. She was born in 1908, and she died in 1986. So uh, quite modern and quite contemporary. Uh, she was brought up in a very bourgeois family, in a very uh, sort of conservative French family. And at a very young age, she was very much interested in, in these ideas of these philosophers and authors. She went to the Sorbonne, and Jean-Paul Sartre used to say that she had better grades than he had. She graduated in philosophy, and for a while she also uh, taught uh, high school philosophy and philosophical ideas. Uh, it is said that uh, her book on the second sex, which is uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, basic uh, description, rather, why is it that women are the second sex, considering that there are only two sexes? In other words, why does she come second? And uh, if one uh, looks back into history, according to Simone de Beauvoir, women are never the absolute, they are always the relative. In other words, you always ask a woman, whose mother are you? Whose daughter are you? Whose sister are you? Whose wife are you? But never, who are you? And so, uh, women have throughout history been uh, dragged as uh, auxiliary, as affiliated to, as related to, as relative, and not as absolute. And therefore, she brings out this concept of être pour soi, being for itself, and être en soi, being in itself. In other words, who am I to others, and who am I to myself, regardless of others? So if I'm going to think of myself today, not as the daughter of so-and-so, and the wife of so-and-so, and the mother of so-and-so, and the grandmother. But who am I alone without any of these? Do still I have any essence? Do I still have any kind of existence? Uh, she says human beings are born free. They have, as existentialists, freedom of choice. Unlike Nietzsche, she believes that women have the right to create themselves, to make themselves as all other human beings. And 
Therefore, in this freedom lies also their shape, their, 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 the, the, the image they want to construct of themselves. Now, uh, if we look back in, uh, I would like to mention here something that is not related to Simone de Beauvoir, but which is something that many feminist writers, you know, feminism started very much as an early movement around the turn of the century with the right to vote for women. But also later in the, in the 40s and the 50s, it became a very strong movement of extremely being, uh, you know, feminist in the sense that anything which is masculine is eliminated. Some went so far as to say that history should be her story because so far history has been his story. Now, we're not talking about that. We're talking about one of the uh, extensions of the article of right, which was about the right of women the right of women to be human beings, to fill their life to the fullest, to live free with choices. And therefore, it is very important here to remember that in a feminist movement or in a Simone de Beauvoir movement, people are not saying that all women should not be mothers, should not get married, should not have children, should, not, uh, should go to work. All they're saying is that women should be equipped with so much economical dependence and so much education that if she chooses to do something else than being to be uh, staying at home, she has choices. She can decide. And if that is available, therefore, woman does not have to sell her body or sell only her menial work, which is domestic help, to be able to, be, uh, to do something which is important. So, uh, for Simone de Beauvoir, in her book, The Second Sex, which was written in 1948, published in 1949, she starts basically about uh, this concept of when we look a little bit about, and maybe this is something we can discuss in class, what are the sort of prejudices, what are the stereotypes about women? When we say women are, what are the things that fall under women? And when we say women, men are, what are the stereotypes that fall under men? Uh, her major uh, contribution is that women are not born, but they are made. They are made to act like women. What does this mean? She, she wants to go very uh, much back in history and see why women are today what they are. And if woman is a slave, why didn't she rebel like any other slaves? All other slaves in history rebelled against their masters. Uh, the proletariat rebelled against the bourgeois, the black rebelled against the white, the feudal system rebelled. So why is it that women, if they are in fact oppressed, why didn't they rebel against the oppressors? So she comes basically to say that man is the essential in this world, the absolute. She is the other. And the other, in the existential point of view, is always an inferior. It's the somebody, you know, when, when you think a little bit, when we talk, say, we are like this, but the others, oh, they are different. The other is always uh, looked up, down upon, and therefore, it is, it is becoming a kind of a discriminatory approach towards the other. Now, she says, if we look into history, uh, and if we look into some of our IS readings, let's look like in IS 203. Who were the females we met? We saw in the epic of Gilgamesh, the harlot, and we saw the mother of Gilgamesh, the goddess. Then we saw in uh, the story of Baal, we saw Anet, the goddess who killed uh, uh, Mot, you know. Uh, we saw Antigone, who was quite, uh, the author uh, gave the name of a book to, the, to, to a woman called Antigone. In fact, Greek tragedies, Sophocles and others, gave a lot of um, uh, uh, weight to women's roles, especially in the uh, tragedies. Although we know that in Athens, which was a democracy, women were not allowed to vote. So it was, uh, Plato talked about uh, the ideal republic, 
But in his ideal republic, there was a philosopher queen, but in reality, there was no uh, power to women. In fact, one of the first uh, uh, rebellious movements that took place in Greece uh, was uh, through a play that one of the Greek authors wrote called Lysistrata, which was a story about how women were very upset about men all the time going to war in Greece, like the Trojan War and the Peloponnesian War, and all the time they are in war. And they only come home to sleep with their wives. If they make them pregnant, they have children, they go back to the war. So one day the woman decided in, the, in one town, all of them to go on strike. And they said when the men come back, no one is going to sleep with them. They even asked the brothels, the prostitutes, to go on strike. And so the basic idea was to show to men that women are human beings, they are not sex objects, and therefore uh, they should be looked upon differently. This was very early, fifth century, you know. But after that, you know, in many of the books we read, we find that women were put in different ways of portrayal. Either they are put very high, they are pure, virgin, uh, saints, uh, divine, or they are put in the gutter, in the sewage, in the prostitute, harlot, and so forth. So this was referred to as the pedestal gutter syndrome. The important thing was what? You either elevate her so much that you can't touch her, or you degrade her so much to get, you know, to look at down upon her. So either you look up to her or you look down to her, but you never look her in the eyes, not at an equal level. So uh, Simone de Beauvoir looks at the history of what has happened of women's movements. She, has, she says that women have no past memory of women's actions. In other words, if you look into history, it's either Helen of Troy who started a war. It's either Dido who fell in love with uh, Aeneas and uh, was the end of her Carthage empire. So these women were not something that women wanted to imitate or to emulate. And therefore, as a result, women have no historical background of past freedom. Neither their mothers, nor grandmothers, nor great-grandmothers, in fact, had a history of this. So, in fact, if I went to my grandmother and I said, I want to do this, she would say, where did you come with this idea? You know, nobody in our family does things like that. So women lack concrete examples of how to rebel or how to bring forth change in their lives. They have no past, they have no history, and they have no memory. So there is nothing on which they can base. They have to start things from scratch. Now, there is a very important point that Simone de Beauvoir talks about, and that is every time we um, attack women on uh, not being equal to men, we bring up the story of biology. Biology, hormones, menstruation, pregnancy, and she says that, you know, uh, the fact that women and men are biologically different is not enough grounds for being legally different or socially different or academically different. Biology, yes, makes the two sexes, genders different. But where is, whereas there could be weaknesses in one, there could be strengths in other things. Therefore, for her, there should be, she doesn't say that women should be men, nor men should be women. But she says there should be equality in difference. Equality in difference. In difference. And therefore, for her, she uses the verb être, the verb to be in French. And the verb to be, she says, is not a static verb. It's a dynamic verb. It's a verb which means that you are in the process of all the time becoming developing, improving, growing, advancing. Therefore, she goes and looks, and this is 1948, huh? we're talking about uh, <laughs> 80 years and yet it's very modern. She looks back and she says, okay, 
if this is the situation of men and women, should that state of affairs continue? In other words, is it in the advantage of women and in the advantage of men to have women stay inferior, unequal, or is it more uh, advantageous for society to have women and men equal? Is it better to have two hands clapping together and forming the world? Or should we abstain from having 50% of the world not engaged in any kind of development? She says, let's look at this state of affairs. We have officially abstract equality. In other words, whenever we see the men talking, they say, oh, well, oh, they're all equal. Look at the Lebanese law. All men, it says in the Constitution, and when somebody says about quota of women in elections, says, why do you need this degrading for women to have quota? They are already equal. There is abstract equality, but there is existing inequality. And therefore, men would rather resort to the Constitution and to the law so that they won't go through the small, petty details of uh, executing them. And then she has this very famous uh, statement which says, the most sympathetic of men never fully understand a woman's concrete situation. And I want here to give you an example. If something is not your problem, or it's not your uh, uh, issue, chances are that you may not understand or defend it as well as somebody who is engaged in this. If we have 128 members in parliament and we don't have women there, we may have some sympathetic men, men who are generous of heart, and they would say, let us pass these laws on behalf of women. But they may never understand what it means for a mother not to give her citizenship to her child because he doesn't go through that. He doesn't know what are the dilemmas. A man will never understand why it is so hard for a woman uh, to take permission to travel, which was what was in Lebanon until 1968. A woman had to have permission uh, from her husband or her father to go and travel on her own. Uh, till today, a woman cannot open an account with an underage daughter in a bank. Uh, she cannot ask for a visa for her daughter if her husband doesn't approve. So the most sympathetic of men, if so far we have had reforms, if so far we have had development, they have been granted to women, but they have not been struggled, struggled and, and earned by women. So she goes further to say that what is the problem then? How shall we pose the question, she says. The question is that man is at the same time judge and party. Man is at the same time the reason why woman is having problems. And at the same time, man is the lawyer, the judge, who is going to solve the problem. In other words, imagine that you go to a doctor and he passes a virus to you, and then you go back to him to tell him, please treat my virus. I'm not saying that man is a virus, but she says that, you know, man is at once judge and party, but so is woman. Woman at one point, she says, I want my rights. And at other times, she enjoys these benefits of being taken care of, of being pampered, of having the door open for you, for having somebody pay your dinner. So there is a hypocrisy on both sides. There is a hypocrisy because man, if you remember what Nietzsche said, what we like about woman is her being lie, lying and beautiful and stupid and so forth. So what is it that woman has to do? Uh, and then she has this very famous sentence. Who is the enemy of man, of woman? Man? But who is man? It's her father, it's her husband, it's her brother, it's her son, it's her nephew. She even goes to say the enemy is sleeping in her bed. And so how can she ev eventually fight it when at the same time she needs to be uh, dependent on him? 
So in fact, it's a very, it's a very different revolution. It's a very different rebellion. This is why she says a not so rebellious other. She's not a proletariat fighting the bourgeois. Today, if you ask all the proletariat of the world to unite, you will find that proletariat women will stand with proletariat men. They will not stay, stand with bourgeois women. So if you say, oh, let all the black women uh, join together, the white women will not join them. So there seems to be a kind of a discrepancy in their concept. So what are therefore the opportunities for women to be able to get out of this trap? The first thing that women need to do, according to uh, Simone de Beauvoir, is that they should become equal good citizens. In other words, when you want to make a law that includes men and women, we cannot have exceptions. We cannot say all women are allowed to vote except those who are not wearing high heels or those who are, you know, we have to be equal to them. But to be equal, you have to be equal equipped also. So education is a must. One of the most important requirements is that in order to be good citizens, we need to have a free and autonomous being like any other human creature. And we have to see which are the roads opened, which are the roads which are blocked. Today, if education is provided to all human beings equally in schools, then women and men are equally endowed, empowered with education. The second thing that we need to find out is that, do we find that women all go to universities, to schools? But when it comes to work, we find that women are not allowed to practice their education. And this is another obstacle that we find. The financial dependency on men creates in women a handicap. You remember when we talked about Freud, he said, man wants women for sex, woman wants men for necessity, for security, for some kind of family, uh, uh, you know, um, a kind of a haven to be able to think that she can, he's, he's the breadwinner, but she is also um, the bread baker, if you want to. So it is important that we, we get these ideas together. Uh, so, women have to be given education and women have to be given economic independence. When women start also earning, now some men do not like this. They say, I don't like my wife to be working and even earning more money than I am. There is here an insecurity because men are afraid that women may bring money home and therefore might change the rules of the game. Or that if my wife is going to go and have conferences with men and meeting and traveling, she might find somebody else and therefore I may not be as important for her. But here there is an interesting thing that Simone de Beauvoir talks about it. She says, okay, if men are up and women are down, equality means that woman has to rise. It doesn't mean that man has to come down. And this is very important. Sometimes she says, women are happy in their golden cage. And because they cannot reach their husbands, they want to bring them down. Please don't go to work, stay with me at home. Please don't do this. Please don't travel. Please don't do research till 12 o'clock at night. I'll be bored at home. So what do we do? We put obstacles in the empowerment of men so that we become equal. And here she takes this approach that all human beings are dynamic. We all have to constantly improve. And if man is 100 miles ahead of us, he's got an advance. But this doesn't mean that he has to slow down. We have to catch up. We have to go faster. Therefore, modern, most women, he says, she says, play on both sides. They want both sides. But she, they have to be very careful about what are the opportunities open to them and what they can do. And this quarrel will go on as long as men and women do not realize that they are complementary and not identical. They are not the same. 
they are complementary. They are mirror images. Whatever I am not, the other is. And we complete each other. And therefore, this is important that we do not imitate each other. We actually complete each other. Now, this quarrel will go on as long as men and women do not realize that uh, they have to uh, act as peers. They are peer groups. And today we find that uh, at some times in the United States, for instance, uh, there was something called positive discrimination. If you apply two people for a job, they would, take, they would take the female rather than the male so that it would be given advantages to women. It, it, it reached to a point where the men started saying, this is not fair because we are equal uh, uh, empowerment, we are equally prepared. Uh, let the best person uh, pass the test, you know. Uh, nowadays, I don't know, but I think that also, whenever a woman goes to apply for a job, and the same uh, is uh, a man goes to apply for a job, we find that sometimes the uh, employer prefers to have uh, a female, uh, a male, because the female is a problem, she gets pregnant, she has children, she has to take off, her children are sleeping, they are fever, they have fever, you know, uh, they are going to have babies. Okay, women are not rabbits, they don't have uh, every year uh, babies. But she's menstruating, this month she will not come, she has a headache, and therefore they'd rather opt for the man. Or if they take the woman, they pay less. So here again, these are issues that we need to educate society about. And she, she says that, you know, woman has been acting as a burden on man. And I think here we should ask the question to the males in the class, you know. When a woman thinks of marriage, she thinks of a house, of a husband, of family, of children, of a long list of marriage. When a man thinks of a house, he thinks of bank scan, he thinks of debts, he thinks of how much he's going to pay, he thinks of how much extra he has to work. To be. And it's a burden on man. Many people don't get married today because it is a burden. And therefore she says, why don't we make this into a partnership that would be so easy on both sides if each one helps other? Man would be liberated in woman's liberation. When woman gets free, man would be liberated. But is this what man dreads? Is this what he's afraid of? Does man, is man scared of this woman coming out and this, this larva becoming a butterfly and flying? Will she fly away? And if she flies away, was there a mistrust from the very beginning? So she comes, she says, women appeal to theoretical equality. Men appeal to concrete inequality. What does this mean? If today we look at all the laws in Lebanon regarding women, we find that women are in a good situation, not because the law gives them the right, because men have been generous. In other words, if every man in every denomination of his religion applies truly the law, Women won't be very beneficial. Today we are hearing so many stories about the right of uh, keeping children in certain denominations, the right of um, divorce, how much a woman should pay in, in retaliation of, or in compensation for divorce. This is an exchange of, it's, a, it's, it's exchange of not two equal values. You know, it's for those who are in the comments, it is an exchange of not two commodities, if I may use the word. One is selling oranges, the other is selling apples. They're not equal value. We need to talk about two equal values in terms of it. So, for women who are sitting at home and have nothing to do, time is a precious burden. For a man, he is always looking for time because he cannot cope with it. So, this concept of time should be balanced. Women should not say, oh, I'm bored, I have nothing to do. And men should say, I'm overworked. Man feels he's a victim. Woman feels that she is a victim. She has nothing to do, although she has a lot to do. 
But man always thinks that, you know, he feels guilty when he's working too much. And woman feels guilty if she goes out of the house. So she goes on to say, woman today is not a product of nature. She is a product of civilization. This is what civilization has turned her into. She is acting like a dead weight. She should open the cage and learn how to fly, but not to fly to extremes and not come back, to fly so that she becomes the equal wings of this bird. If the society is a bird, it should fly with its uh, equal wings. Uh, now, one would ask which would come first, education or uh, economic independence? or uh, personality, she says, there's no time. The forest has to, be, has to be planted all at once. We cannot afford to say, let's do this first and let's do this. It has to be at all levels. We have to plant the forest all at once. Let the woman be equipped with the up, 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 upbringing problems, because it starts in the family, in the education, from the moment the child is born, we find the pink ribbon and the blue ribbon and the cigar and the bonbon. And well, Amalish, it's okay, next time you will have a boy if it's a girl. And then we have the way education is done in school. Uh, girls have books that, uh, you know, in, in the past we used to have always the mother cooking and the father sitting in the rocking chair with a pipe. Uh, the upbringing has to be different. The curriculum has to be different. The opportunities have to be equal. The empowerment, the trust, and the belief that the world is a difficult place and it needs all people to be engaged to be able to bring a qualitative change. We cannot afford to have one group working and one group depending on the other. Women is truly uh, different, but she's capable. And together, they can bring forth a change which is better for the children, for the family, and for society. So this is the second sex of Simone de Beauvoir. There is a lot of material for discussion. We will use this discussion on Tuesday in the classroom, in our Zoom discussion. But think a little bit about these issues, and think a little bit about the stereotypes. And I want some of the males to give me their feedback. Thank you.